Just leave on blue, clear, take off, your left hand. Take off, left, with the sweet one. Left left, swing west, copy. Hello and welcome to the Blue Skies Podcast. I'm PR Ganapati, your host. Continuing in our series on the LCA Tejas, I have my great pleasure today of speaking to a legendary test pilot who flew the first flight of the LCA, Wing Commander Rajiv Kothial. Uh, Wing Commander Kothial uh, is an experimental test pilot, a winner of the famous Ivan Kinchlow Award of the Society of Experimental Test Pilots. And we're going to speak to him about his career, about his training as a test pilot, and about his experience uh, with the LCA Tejas program. Uh, welcome to the program, sir. Thank you so much for speaking to us. Thank you very much, Gana. Pleasure, sir. Pleasure to have you here. So, sir, we just love to know a little more about our guests. And so, where did you grow up? Uh, where, what was your initial education like? What was your motivation to join the service? And what were some of those initial experiences which aircraft did you fly um, in the initial years of your service career? Okay, that's a long question. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Please take as much time as you like, sir. Okay, so I grew up in Dehradun. My father was a doctor having his own uh, clinic. And I studied in a private school called Cameron Hall. I did my schooling entirely from kindergarten to ISC in one school. So I was lucky that way. And I was a science student. After that, the time came to decide what the career one would choose. So I thought my cousin was a Air Force pilot. He was flying fighters. So I think that motivated me to join the Air Force. I prepared for the UPSC exam and uh, passed in the first attempt itself and joined NDA. So I joined NDA as an Air Force cadet and passed out in 78. Thereafter training in Bidar and all that, Hakim Pet, and then Tezpur for the mix. And finally operational squad was 26 squad in Pathan Court. Right. So I flew MiG-21s there and thereafter I was sent to the uh, flight instructors course in Tamram. So I completed that, became an instructor, spent one and a half years in Bidar and uh, subsequently I was posted to MiG-29s when they were inducted into the Indian Air Force. Oh, fascinating. Okay. Yeah. Which squadron were you in? 28 squadron in Pune. Ah, okay. Lovely. My father's old squadron. <laughs> <laughs> okay. He commanded it uh, 73 to 76 in Tezpur. In Tezpur. Yeah, and then I think he was Commodore Commandant maybe about the time you were in the squadron, I think. Yeah, I was in 28 earlier also during my Tezpur tenure. When during the training days, I was in I was in 28 squadron for a year for MiG, MiG training. That was in 1980. Okay, so when I was in the MiG-29 squadron, a signal came asking for pilots uh, for uh, abroad test pilot school which was usa so i applied for it came to ast got selected and in may of 1989 i went to the us to do my test pilot course amazing amazing so there's a lot of questions i have so if i can just stop you and go back a little bit uh, so air force academy which aircraft did you fly in your in your basic was it Still the HT2 at that time or had it moved to? Yeah, in, in Bidar we flew the HT2 and then uh, in Ish Iskara? Ishkara is in Hakim Pet. And uh, 26 squadron in Pathankot was type 96 or were you? No, so it was MiG-20 and BIS. Oh, BIS already. Okay. Yeah. Uh -huh. Very nice. What were your experiences like flying the MiG-29, sir? No, it was quite good. The aircraft were new. Everything was working fine. The radar, the infrared. So it was good fun to pull G and also lock on to the other aircraft and get your you know signal to fire the missile so it was pretty good right only thing you have to be pretty fit to pull 9g most <laughs> of the time yeah a powerful aircraft isn't it? yeah very powerful 
And um, it also, did it have a helmet mounted sight at that time or did it did that come later? No, no, it was there. That was the, inf- in, it was through the infrared. So you could lock on to the target using the infrared seeker. Uh, of course, range was limited and uh, fire the missile accordingly. What was your experience like as an instructor? So which aircraft were you instructing on in the academy? And- I was in Bidar actually. I was instructing in Bidar, in the Kiran. Mark 1s and that was one and a half year tenure and I upgraded my category to A2 in that one and a half years. So I became an A2 instructor. In fact, uh, Ritu Rastyagi was one of my pupils. Yes, he was mentioning during his... Uh... <laughs> yeah, Kerala days he was one of my pupils that time. Yeah, he said that uh, and that was the motivation for him to become a test pilot later as he said people I looked up to in the Air Force like when Kokotial became test pilot so I said I have to be... A part of that group so uh-huh. <laughs> you, a lot of effect yeah yeah and test pilot school was a becoming a test pilot you know part of your career plan or was it just that signal that kind of triggered the interest in doing that no even from bidar they had asked us to come for interview for test pilot course i had applied that time also so i originally planned to do the test pilot course it's just that uh, my name came from MiG-29, so my name from the test pilot list was scrapped. Ah, uh-huh, okay. And I was sent to MiG-29. So later on, when the signal came, I applied. Of course, a lot of other people also applied. And then we had a selection process in AST under a Marshal Lamba. Ah, that- uh-huh, okay. So, uh, so, you know, we had set up our own experimental test pilots uh, course um, in 76, I think, my... Father was the OCTPS when he set that up. And so we'd started training test pilots in India itself. But I think at that time, there was also this thinking that from time to time, we should send our test pilots abroad so that we keep in touch with the latest developments in test flying. So was that call for training in Edwards kind of part of that philosophy? Or what was the thinking behind sending uh, people abroad for test pilot training? Actually, they were looking for a test pilot for LCA. And LCA was supposed to be a fly by wire flight control system aircraft. And uh, we did not have any expertise in testing fly by wire systems in India. Ah, oh, okay. So basically, they decided to send me and one engineer later on, who Uday Shankar, his name was, one TP, one FTE to do the course and then work on the LCA program. Okay, so it's almost earmarked from the beginning. Okay. Yeah. And what is test pilot selection like? So what do they make you do? Is it theory? Is it oral? Is it uh, practical flying? All three of the above? All three of the above, actually. Some ground test, um, mostly flying. On aeroplanes, you haven't flown before. Like I flew the Jaguar, the Avro, and then they carried out your assessment. Basically, they want to see how adaptable you are to a new machine, which you haven't flown before. Fascinating. Okay, sir. So... um... Now we can talk about Edwards, uh, you know, just for the audience uh, who are not familiar with Edwards, uh, just tell us uh, it is the mecca of test flying, I know, but I just love to hear from you what is the, you know, the position of Edwards in the world of military aviation, test flying. Yeah, have you read the book, The Right Stuff? <laughs> read the book, watched the movie many times, uh, ah, I recommend so it to the audience. <laughs> So that's the one which talks only about test pilots and Edwards Air Force Base. So it was a, I would say it was a great and novel experience. There were about uh, 18 of us in the class. And there are two classes running currently. One starts in Jan, the other in May. So I went for the 89B class, which started in May, June. And uh, basically I flew about 20 different types there. Fascinating. What was the fleet like? The basic uh, training fleet was the F-4 and the T-38 Talon. Okay. And then you got an opportunity to fly more and more aeroplanes as part of the syllabus. So if there are four things which I remember clearly from that. Firstly, it was that one got an opportunity to fly different aeroplanes. And I flew about 14 flights on different aeroplanes like the F-15, F-16, F-18, F-111, wow. Alpha Jet, mm. big aeroplanes like C-130, C-141, and even some turboprop. We even flew gliders. Fascinating. Yeah. So that was one aspect. The second aspect was uh, 
which I remember clearly was we even did shuttle approaches simulating the landing of the space shuttle. Uh-huh. So we did that on a T-38 with about 30 degrees pitch down sim- simulating the rate of descent of the shuttle and we landed on the Rogers dry lake bed. On the dry lake, okay. <laughs> you know, it's about 12 kilometers long, the longest runway on that. So that was just to practice the shuttle approaches. And that's without the engine, right? You, the engine is idling. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, engine was idling because with 30 degrees, the speed would have <laughs> gone quite high. Yeah, but you know, the runway was long. So even if you made a little bit error that you're overshooting, right, right. you, could, you could easily adjust and cover it up on a 12 kilometer long runway. Then uh, uh, another aspect was that you got to fly an aeroplane without doing a dual check on it. So I flew the A7. Because in test flying, it could happen that, you know, you are gone to evaluate an airplane where there is no two-seater trainer available. So you have to just read the flight manual, sit in the cockpit, go through your procedure, checklist, failures, handling, and then go and fly. So that was a novel experience. Uh And the last thing which I remember clearly is the abroad trip. We went to French test pilot school to the Italian Flight Test Center, to Naval Test Pilot School, Pax River, on a visit of about 10 days. And got to I got to fly the Alpha Jet in France that time. So, you know, um, when Tommy Thomas we had interviewed earlier, and he spoke about how he really struggled with uh, some of the math and things like that. He said, you know, a lot of the U.S. folks came with aeronautical degrees from the likes of MIT, whereas we Indians you know, went with uh, not quite the same theoretical foundation. Was it the same sort of thing in your time? Yeah, they all had degrees. But though it was challenging, it was not too difficult. I managed to cope up with it. So uh, somehow I don't remember (laughs) remembering the maths. And uh, most of the programs were written, uh, software programs were written for the data analysis. So you could just, you know, you could use the software and uh, analyze your data. Crunching, right, right. Yeah. Okay. What are some of the interesting things you saw there in terms of, say, you know, planning or telemetry, you know, things like that, that we didn't do at that time that you were exposed to and then later managed to come and implement here in our programs? Well, mainly what I noticed was that we didn't have much of software here, which they were using for data analysis, quite a bit of it. Then flight control system theory and testing was what we didn't have in our school. And of course, I didn't have any opportunity to implement because I was not in the test pilot school here. But when I, when I came back, I gave them a brief and then it was up to them to implement. So I think by now they must have implemented flight control systems testing. And so you were sent specifically for fly-by-wire. And, um, so what, are the, what was the exposure that you got to those specific aspects? Uh, and on which aircraft was that? What are some things that you learned there that you could then come and apply here to the Tejas program? One was uh, the theory part, which was pretty extensive. And the flying was uh, in the Learjet. They gave us exposure in the Learjet, which belonged That's to Cal- the Calspan. Calspan car. Uh-huh. Variable space stability aircraft. Okay. Yeah. So they, they gave us flights in that to assess the control laws. So finally, when we were launching the LCA software, we, we again went back to Calspan and then we tested it in the Vista F-16, in the NT-33, which I'll cover in the next part. Right, so when we talk about the LCA. Tommy said, mentioned how, you know, without a car, he struggled and the allowances were very low and he was really struggling to make ends meet and things like that. I'm hoping by your time, things were a little better. I mean, uh, I was on a posting because the whole course became more than a year. So it was not a temporary duty. So because I had to do English also, English language course at Air Force Station, uh, Air Force Base, Lackland in Texas. So that made the course length uh, more than a year. So it became a posting. In which case I was entitled to take my family with me. So I don't know whether Tommy sir took his family or not. No, I don't think he did. Okay. So this was a big help. I had uh, two kids that time. One was four years old. Daughter was only two months old. So my wife had hands full and uh, she managed the house and also at times my typing for the <laughs> reports. <laughs> reports. <laughs> yeah. Because I was not used to typing and I didn't have time to learn. 
So we bought a computer there, some 8088 microprocessor based with the dot matrix printer. And <laughs> I used to handwrite the uh, reports and she used to, oh, you know, nice. type them out. <laughs> yeah. My mother used to type my father's reports in staff college, she says. <laughs> so I think that tradition of Air Force wives helping their husbands with report writing continues. <laughs> Correct. And, and how, how about the other course, other members of the course? Where were they from? Were they any foreigners? Were they all? Yeah, members? so there were three foreigners. One was me and the other two were Canadians. So hardly okay. any foreigners. Hardly any. Hardly. So actually, actually, I was the only foreigner in the class. And my class leader was a female called Major Eileen Collins. Now, if you've heard of her, she was the first woman into space. Oh, wow. Okay. In the 90s. After the test pilot score, she joined NASA and she went in the space shuttle. I think two, three times she went into space. And what I noticed, uh, go ahead, you can ask. And what I noticed, she was a class leader. She was a 141, C-141 pilot. Uh -huh. So what I observed was that like, unlike our school, where uh, transport pilots don't become test pilots, there was no such restriction in the US. Right, right. And she flew all the fighters also, the same way as we were flying. During the class, I also observed the casual uh, manner in which the Americans behaved. You know, we were all that British type, classroom, sit straight, be attentive, pay attention, be respectful. So here I would find the guys with their feet on the table, classes going on, drink in their hand. And even the instructor didn't mind, it was all accepted. So that was a, that was a big cultural change for me. Were they very curious about the aircraft that you had flown, the MiG-21? The MiG-29 was the big enemy for them at that time. They were designing all their aircraft to fight against the MiG-29, and you came with MiG-29 experience. So were they peppering you with questions about that? And how did you handle yeah, it? Yeah, they, they tried to, <laughs> because uh, MiG-29 had just come into service, and they did not know much enough about it. So they asked me, but I said, it's classified. So I didn't tell them anything. <laughs> And they respected that. I mean, they didn't expect me to tell. And that time we were not so close to US. We were closer to Russia in the 90s. Now, you were flying uh, the F-16 there, which uh, was, you know, the big adversary for us here in the subcontinent. And so were you kind of, you know, on the side also making notes of its performance and its limitations so that we could be more informed about it uh, on our side? Yeah, yeah, I was, I was doing all that. And later on, when I came back, I was sent to different bases, including TAG-D, the Air Force Station Gwalior, to give a lecture uh, briefing on whatever I observed during the... I'm glad to hear that, you know, we made use of that opportunity to educate ourselves about that aircraft. Yeah. Are you still in touch with some of your class from Edwards? Yes, at times, on and off. Not very regularly, but whenever something happens or something, then we correspond. So career-wise, you know, our test pilots come, they do some test flying, then they also have, you know, service obligations, squadron command, flight command, this thing, all these things. Is it very similar there or do they, once they become test pilots, they pretty much stay in test flying for the rest of their careers or do they also have a mix of, of both types? I think there's a mix of both types because there are guys who have continued to stay in test flying and there are guys who have gone back and uh, got promoted to higher ranks. Higher rank, okay. Mm. But uh, I'm not very sure of who all became, uh, who all rose to what rank. Any other interesting experiences that I haven't asked you about, sir? Yeah, one last anecdote. We, we, were, in, we were in the Air Force space and we decided to go out for uh, buying groceries. So my son was five years old there. So me, wife, and uh, our small daughter, we went and left him at home, asking him to watch cartoons. Okay. So he was at home, and we had a independent villa in the in the base itself, where all the students were staying, you know, close to each other. When we came back, we saw a police van parked outside with a dog sitting, uh, guarding our house. Oh my god! So we asked him what happened. He said your son called nine one one, and he said he is afraid frightened <laughs> and that's why we have come 
So that's the time I realized that you couldn't you couldn't leave a kid less than twelve years old unattended in the U.S. Right. right. Because in India we just leave them. <laughs> so that was a funny exposure to life there. And then they let me off, of course, because knowing that right. I was a foreign student and right, right, I right. did not know the rules. But next yeah. time we either took them or we, you know, found didn't leave them. Yeah, yeah, some babysitter was found. <laughs> Right, right. That's right. what he did. Very nice. And of course, you had to buy a car there. There was no choice. Yeah, no choice. Right. Because the Especially. base is huge, mm. and you have to go, keep going up and down from your classroom yeah. back home. Was there uh, like my father when he went to ETPS? There was this hand me down that every Indian test pilot sold to the next Indian test pilot. Was there something like that? A used car that kept getting no, sold from one student to the other? <laughs> no, unfortunately, there wasn't a thing like that. Yeah. So I had to go to the used car lot and pick out a Ford Mustang. Okay. Oh, old one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> old one, which, of, which fitted my budget. Right, right. So... And use that, and when I finished, I sold it off, and I didn't lose any money, so that was no, pretty right. good. <laughs> was Pancho Ban's bar uh, up and running in your time, sir? Oh. I think so. Oh, okay. But I don't recollect now, but I think it was there. Yeah, years later, 99, 2000, my father got an invitation, and I took him to Edwards, and when we went to Pancho Ban's bar, it had collapsed, unfortunately, so oh. uh, we could only see the kind of another rafters and the beams had all fallen down, but it was not operational. <laughs> right. Anyway, uh, do you think the movie Right Stuff is a pretty accurate description of what it was like in Edwards? I think so. Because I read the book only when I got selected to go do the course. And before that, before that, I had not heard about the book. Somebody mentioned it to me when I was saying that I'm going to Edwards. So that's the time I read the book, and uh, you know things were pretty accurate there. Very nice. Have you seen the movies? Others, I'd, lo I'd love to ship you a DVD to watch. No, I haven't seen the movie. I think I have not. Uh, seen I'll it. send you. I'll send you a DVD. <laughs> so once you came back, you went straight to the LCA programs, or were you part of the flight test squadron for a while? Or? No, I was part of the flight test squadron for most of the time. I stayed from 90 to 93 in AST, but I was also asked to interact with uh, ADA and give them inputs, piloting inputs on whatever they required at that time, because NFTC had not yet formed. Correct. So AST and HL were the only two agencies which are providing them test pilots. Ah, okay. So I used to attend meetings and give inputs. They were still at the beginning stage, you know, deciding the cockpit layouts and different systems, symbologies on the multifunction displays, things like that. Any interesting trials that you were doing as part of the FTS at that time, sir? FTS, mostly our trials were limited to TRDO manufactured trial equipment, you know, armament, basically. So rockets, bombs, firing those in Jaisalmer and then giving them the feedback. That was the main job which I did in AST. What was the AST fleet like at that time, sir? Did you have a Mirage? Did you have a Jaguar? Jaguars were there. MiG-21 was there. Mirage had not yet come. At least I didn't fly it in the AST, but I flew it in Gwalior. Because they used to go for their evaluation to the MiG-29s and to the Mirage 2000s during their test pilot course. Got it, got it. So, sir, changing gears now to the Tejas program. So, what was your first involvement? I know that you had been, in some sense, handpicked for the to go to the Edwards Air Force Base uh, Test Pilot School to train as a test pilot because of uh, the need to really learn about control systems, fly-by-wire and whatnot. But just love to hear about your journey into the world of the Tejas. Okay, so after I came back from Edwards, I was posted to AST. And there I was uh, involved with the LCA program at that time itself. After I finished my AST tenure of three years, I did staff college and went to 
Pune, 47th squad, big, big 29th. In one of the trips to Delhi, I happened to meet a Marshal Rajkumar, who was in air headquarters then. And he mentioned about the formation of NFTC and whether I wanted to join. I willingly said yes. And in 95, I joined NFTC. So that's how we started the LCA program involvement. And what was the stage of the of the program at that point in time? And what were the sorts of things you got involved with at that stage? Well, they had already frozen the cockpit design by taking input from other pilots, operational pilots, AST pilots, HL pilots. So there was not much we could do as far as uh, cockpit design was concerned. But we got involved in other things like fuel system test rig, the real-time simulator for the fly-by-wire flight controls software, and any other meetings which came up where pilot involvement was required. Great. And so fast forwarding a little bit to, you know, uh, close to the first flight, what was some of the preparation leading up to the first flight? And I know it was you and later I, Marshal Nambiar, who were some of the active test pilots at that time. Uh, you know, when did you find out that you were going to be the one to fly the first flight, which is quite in a test pilot's career, you know, the dream opportunity. Uh, what did you feel like? What was that? Uh, what was that conversation like at that point? Actually, we had uh, two pilots from the Air Force. That was me and Nambia. And we had two HL pilots, Wing Commander Rakesh Sharma and late Skandi Baldev Singh. Uh-huh. So Rakesh Sharma unfortunately became more than 50 years old. And Air Marshal Rajkumar said that anybody who has to fly the LCA would have to be less than 50. So automatically the choice came to me. <laughs> so I was thrilled. But at that stage, we one wasn't sure when the aircraft was going to fly. Because nothing was certain in the 95 to 2000 stage. So that's how it happened. And did you participate also in some of the control law testing in the... Um, on the Calspan F-16 and things like that in the interim years? Yeah, I did that. So basically, before the first flight, a number of ground tests had to be done to get the aircraft and its systems ready. So basically, the most important one out of this was the fly-by-wire system. So the fly-by-wire system was a quadruplex digital uh, flight control system with no analog or digital backup. The hardware, like actuators and all, was bought from abroad, but the software was entirely indigenous. So what we did was, first thing we did in the real-time simulator, we carried out normal and failure state testing of the software. Hundreds of hours were put in by the pilots. After we had tested to our satisfaction, the software was then ported onto the uh, Vista F-16 and the NT-33. And we all went to Calspan to check the control laws flying those aircraft. And we found that there was a good correlation between what we had observed in the RTS to what we had found in the uh, Vista F-16. The last phase of testing of the fly-by-wire system was the Ironbird. The Ironbird is a ground test rig where the fly- hardware and software both are tested in normal and failure states. So once we had finished testing, we found that the software version had changed a number of times because probably enough emphasis had not been placed on failure testing on their own by the designers. Only when the software was cleared, finally, then it was coded and ported onto the digital flight control computer and put on board the aircraft. So that was as far as the fly-by-wire flight control system testing was concerned. After that, we had to test the aircraft was also getting ready. So we had to test the aircraft and for its integration with the engine and other systems. So a number of ground runs were carried out to test this. Once, Once the ground test was done, then we carried out taxi trials Mm -hmm. and in taxi trials we did taxiing at increments of 50 kilometers per hour up to a rotation speed of 260 kilometers per hour in the last taxi run i accelerated to 250 kilometers per hour throttle back fully raised the nose wheel the nose wheel came up very predictably and beautifully lowered the nose wheel deployed the brake parachute and stopped the aircraft and that was the green signal to go ahead with the first flight First flight, wow. So, you know, I just want to take you back a little bit to the nuclear tests and the sanctions of 98. Um, What were some of the things that were in progress at that time that were impacted by that uh, 
those sanctions and those restrictions because I think the collaboration with the Americans was quite a bit at that point and suddenly you had to do things on your own, isn't it? Yeah, actually we had a consultancy with them for the fly-by-wire flight control system. And basically once the nuclear test happened, they put sanctions and all our uh, consultation with the Americans was stopped. So that put the program uh, back a bit. So we persevered and carried on indigenously, whatever we could do. But finally, we needed their help to be sure that we were doing the right thing. So that is why there was a further delay in the program. That was the only thing which really uh, impacted uh, the schedule. Great. So uh, coming to the first flight, you had done the high-speed taxi, raised the nose. And then after that, I, I think Amash Rajkumar has spoken in his interview about the FFRB, First Flight Review Board, and yeah. I think Minko Ravindran has also mentioned that. Correct. So that was, that was, that was, I mean, we were only participants in that. It was to be reviewed by other people, whether we were ready for first flight or not. So finally, when the meeting concluded, they said that they were, they found no reason why the first flight should not go ahead. Everything had been taken into account, all safety issues had been addressed. And so they cleared the aircraft for first flight. Did you did you feel like a um, an electric feeling pass through yourself? The excitement that this was finally coming to fruition, and <laughs> first flight is going to happen. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it did, it did. <laughs> so tell us about that day. So you know, did you sleep the previous night? <laughs> yeah, I slept the previous night, as far as I remember now. Actually, it had been raining uh, a little bit uh, the past few days. But on, on that day, the sky was blue, sun was shining brightly, light winds, unlimited visibility. In fact, an ideal day to day, day to do first flight of a prototype. <laughs> right. Now, the fact that there were lots of VIPs there, is that, you know, kind of an unhealthy sort of pressure that, you know, you would be pressured into pressing on even if you found something that might have otherwise caused you to pause? Because I think the defense minister, the chief, they were all there, isn't it? Yeah, but, uh, you know, they, they didn't affect us. Because once we, I got into the cockpit and started my checks and procedures, everybody else was cut off. And I didn't remember anybody being there or monitoring anything. And similarly, in the con mission control center, where Marshal Rajkumar was sitting. I'm sure no VIPs and all were allowed to enter there to disturb them. So I don't think that that had any impact on our decision-making or on our performance at all. Mm -hmm. Right. So tell us about the flights, the first flight from starting okay. from maybe the briefing, walk to the aircraft. And... <laughs> yeah, so we carried out the pre-flight briefing in the flight test center. The chief, Air Chief Marshal uh, Tipnis was there attending the brief. In fact, he was flying in the one of the Chase Mirage 2000 with Tarun Banerjee. And in the other aircraft, it was Nambiar with uh, Soggy Krishna as a photographer. So once the briefing was done, medical was done, I walked to the aircraft. And there I found a huge crowd of HL employees all over the place. <laughs> right on rooftops, AST, there were people standing on the roof. And the periphery road of HL was all lined up with, uh, you know, the press, with their cameras and all that, <laughs> because no press was allowed, no press was allowed inside. Okay. It was not a, it was not a declared uh, sort of first flight that press was allowed inside. They were all outside and they were filming from there. So I saw all that. And then once I got into the cockpit and started my checks and procedures, everybody, as you know, I totally concentrated on my tasks and everything else was forgotten. The engine started beautifully, the checks and procedures after that, all the built-in tests of the fly-by-wire flight control system, everything passed. The chase aircraft taxied out and I taxied behind them. So there's a YouTube video of the first flight. Have you seen it? Yes, sir. Because I've seen it and uh, this has got it the gives me uh, even goosebumps <laughs> when I see it. Uh, yeah, and it's got uh, the RT recorded between me and the chase aircraft and me and the Flight control, high mission control. It's got the view, th view through the HUD, the view that you were seeing also. Yeah, so that's a nice one which Ada has put up. Yeah, I'll share that with the listeners. I mean. So I lined up, did my final control checks, and waited for Nambiar's call to start rolling. So once he positioned correctly behind, and he told me to start, I start the roll. 
At 250 knots, I raised the nose wheel and unstuck, and the aircraft rose beautifully into the air and flew into the blue skies. Wow. The aircraft climbed effortlessly without any problems, and uh, I carried out some test you points. You left the gear down, isn't it? Like you, like one normally yeah, does the first, first flight, flight, you left the gear down, right? Mm. Yeah, just as a just to be uh, as a means of precaution, prudence. You don't want the gear not coming down in the first flight <laughs> for some reason or the other. Right. So it's better to do the first flight with the gear down. So we left the gear down. The flight was total 18 minutes. Now you had a telemetry loss soon after getting airborne. <laughs> I wanted to avoid that, but since yeah, since you are aware. Okay, so what happened was the moment I got airborne, Ravindran said, we have all the screens here are blank. Oh my. So I heard that and I said, great. <laughs> what else one has to say? So a quick, quick, quick decision had to be taken to go or no go. But since all the aircraft systems are behaving fine, we decided to continue with the mission. Because anyway, we had to land back. So another few minutes would not have mattered. So since the systems were performing well, everything was available to me in the flight. So though all the ground controllers are staring at blank screens, but it, it caught on during the approach again. The telemetry locked on again. So that was the only major <laughs> happening during the first flight, actually. So I carried out the uh, test points, basically some handling, some air data check with the Mirage 2000. And I found that the handling qualities were very good. All the systems behaved perfectly. And then it was time to come in for the approach and landing, the most critical task. Because all the simulator work we had been doing in the RTS, IFS and all, everything was, you know, concentrated on carrying out a good approach and landing performance of the aircraft. So I lined up about, I came in on a long finals, about seven, eight kilometers long, so that there was enough time to settle down. And I found that the aircraft behaved beautifully. The handling qualities were predictable and smooth. As I approached the threshold, I fled, touched down smoothly, lowered the nose wheel and deployed the brake parachute. And the rest, as you they say, is history. Wow. <laughs> Were you using any sort of, uh, you know, the uh, had you tuned the ILS or something like that? Were you doing that purely visual? No, no, it was pure visual because ILS and all were not yet incorporated in the aircraft. Not yet in the, incorporated into the aircraft. Okay. Uh -huh, got so it. hard, hard head-up symbology was there. Velocity vector was there. Speeds were indicated on the head-up. And we found a good correlation between the speeds on the head-up display and what the Mirage 2000 aircraft was giving me. So I decided to use the speed because the angle of attack indication on the head was not very accurate. Okay. It was not At that time, was not matching properly. So we decided to ignore that. Just concentrate on the speeds and land. Mm. So of course, after I landed, I taxied back and there was a big... <laughs> Big Allah going on with Defense Minister, everybody jostling each other to come to the aircraft. And, you know, it was really good fun. But the most important part was that it all happened well. Smoothly. All's well that end, ends well. Yeah, it happened smoothly. Yeah, and so all my thanks to Team LCA, who did a grand job during those days. And subsequently, I suppose. And so you continued to fly, you and um, that time when Columbia continued to fly the uh, first prototype for the first 12 sorties, I believe, right? Yeah, the first, the first two aircraft were called technology demonstrators, TD1 and TD2, because we had to demonstrate these four core technologies. That is the flyby flight control system, the composite airframe, the glass cockpit, and microprocessor-based control of gentle systems. So these four technologies had to be proven in TD1 and TD2. So I flew the first six flights for TD1. In the second flight, uh, I raised the landing gear. Okay, uneventful. It came down beautifully when it, uh, it was time to land. And in the fourth flight, I did a fly pass at Aero India Air Show in Yalanka. I think it's an unprecedented event where the prototype in the fourth flight is doing a fly pass. In the fourth flight, right. Yeah. <laughs> then I did some air data calibration in the fifth and sixth flight. And the rest of the calibration was done by Nambia. The next six flights were done by him. And after 12 flights, TD1 was grounded because that was what was the mandate for it to do. And we had to get ready for TD2. 
So this process, you know, obviously you're developing a new aircraft. So as you capture various, you know, data points and things like that, you've got to then work on incorporating improvements into that aircraft. It, you know, it, uh, and if you have two technology demonstrators, then while one is flying, you can work on, you know, changes to the other. But is this normal to test programs, uh, having two TD, you know, the, whatever prototype versions that you're working on? or the, are, Typically, are there more that are involved? Uh, how is our program different from any other program? Well, I haven't seen other, in detail, other programs. But I would uh, first say that the technology demonstrator part for us was a new one. Because usually what people do is they start off with PV, prototype vehicles, have two, three of them and prove them for different stages of the envelope expansion. But in our case, the sanction was given in such a manner by the government of India that first they said you prove all these things, then we'll give you more financial sanction to start the uh, prototype testing. So once it was proven that we could handle the fly-by-wire and the glass cockpit and all the other software uh, involved, then they were readily able to open the purse strings and you know, give us more money to start the prototype vehicle uh, manufacture and testing. So I think there were four PVs. I'm not sure because I had left the program by then. Right, right. But uh, the end end product you see now is so good. Everybody is raving about it in the squad. So obviously the design and development team has done a good job over the years, improving from one aircraft to the other. Yeah, it must give you great satisfaction to have seen the aircraft develop from where you saw it to where it yeah, is today. Absolutely. And, you know, we're on the verge, hopefully, of some foreign orders and things like that. So it's quite an exciting time. Yeah, hopefully it materializes. It's not only the product, but how you maintain it, how easy it is to maintain, what support, spare support can you provide. If you can't provide spare support, then obviously, again, it's a big problem to maintain the fleet strength operationally, you know. So I think that there's a lot of need to get the private sector involved so that there is more scope for improvement in these areas. And also that will help in indigenization of the uh, LRUs of the aircraft. Right, right. So we're talking about, you know, the time that it's taken to develop it. Now, the lessons from this program for future programs, how could we do things differently so that they're developed faster? Is it more test pilots? Is it more prototype vehicles? Is it more engineering resources, all of the above? What is your... Actually, once when you look at that, when you look at the time period, you, you look at what was the state of the Indian aviation industry in the 1990s. Where the last indigenous prototype, the HF-24 Marut, flew way back in 1961. After that, what were we doing? Only licensed production of proven foreign designs. So there was no infrastructure, no technical database, no expertise to design and develop a state-of-the-art fourth-generation fighter with fly-by-wire, flight control system, glass cockpit. So what we embarked at that time was, not only were we making a modern fighter aircraft, we were also setting up an entire system to do so at the same time. So which was a challenging task itself. And probably that is the reason why it has taken more time. But if you see the time period, the financial sanction for TD1 and TD2 came only in 1993. Before that, it was nothing. I mean, you could do a few little, little bit of work, but since financial sanction was not there, you could not really, you know, hire consultants and start moving ahead at a great pace. So from 93 to 2001, in spite of the sanctions, I think is not bad. Yeah. And as far as the lessons are concerned, lessons learned is that the test pilot should be involved right from the beginning and the test pilot should have continuity. Initially, initially what happened was that they interacted with HL test pilots who were not available full time to ADA. They interacted with operational pilots who came once in a while on uh, temporary duty. They interacted with uh, pilots from AST who were, you know, not continuous, but who, whosoever was available was put on the job. So there was no real continuity, and that is why the LCA cockpit 
when it was first time when we saw it we found that there were many you know things which were not exactly right as far as the user interface was concerned right right, right. but since we were only demonstrating technology we let it go because we didn't want to delay the program any further but subsequently as the pv 1 2 3 4 and all flew you know design changes were made and it was made more user friendly more operational effectiveness incorporated in it so now we have established our technical expertise infrastructure database so it should be easy to you know make the next generation fighter and do you feel like some of those capabilities have also you know had a rub off effect on other programs such as say the IJT or HTT40 or the SARS or ALH LUH LCH and maybe the um, twin engine deck based fighter that's in the works and things like that i'm sure it must have but i since i didn't i wasn't in the program subsequently i won't have details to this but the capability is all in house so it is easily one is easily able to tap the capability now and once you have built the test rigs and all that to build the next test rig for matching the next fighter you are going to make you have learned a lot of lessons and you will be able to do a better job because the test rigs also came up quite late in the program actually the fuel test like for example the fuel system test rig or the structures test rig some can be used for the other programs but some are very specific to lca so sir i want to talk to you about uh, the society of experimental test pilots and the ivan kinchlow award which is uh, you know awarded to the best test pilot doing very exciting work on the cutting edge you were the first indian to win that award so tell us about sctp and that award how you found out that you had been uh, that you were going to get it and how that you know interaction with the sctp uh, uh, that function how was that what was that like yeah so what happened was after i had flown the first flight we said we should become members of sctp so we applied and became members then in uh, 2001 uh, october they have a annual symposium every year in which you can you know send in your papers and present the papers so we decided to present the first flight of lca as a presentation during the symposium so this was prepared by between me and banerji Nambia had, I think, left by then for the squadron, and Ravindran helped in, and uh, we went. Me and Banerjee went to Los Angeles to present this paper. Meanwhile, we had also submitted a citation for the Ivan C. Kinchlo Award. Now, I, before that, I never heard of this award. <laughs> 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 the, before it suddenly occurred to Vishal Rajkumar that probably you know we should uh, put up. this guy for this award so so we went there and we were happily there was a nice banquet and all that paper was presented in the morning evening there was a banquet and we were all sitting there when they they don't tell you who's who's won it you come to know at that instant only when you when you win it when you are sitting in the bank <laughs> oh it's a little like an oscar award <laughs> yeah it was a big surprise to me when my name was you know called out because we didn't really expect uh, amongst all the other you know test pilots of the world competing with a humble lca so we really didn't expect to get but i think what they considered was the fact that we had not developed any aircraft for the last 40 years and suddenly we had developed a, a one with fly by wire and complex technologies so the role of the test pilot in you know macro managing the whole affair was sort of recognized right right and that's why they probably you know gave it to us so then you once your name is announced you walk and i am one see kinchlo is uh, kinchlo is late so his nephew is the one who gave the award with the sctp president on one side i have that picture here and then i spoke on the mic i had not even prepared a speech you can imagine <laughs> I, i wasted <laughs> i wasted a golden opportunity there but i never imagined that you know i'll be ever walking up to the dais to receive the award so then we brought the award back the trophy and then i was sent to delhi to show it to the chief and after that the trophy is uh, in my house now adorning my study table 
you also were awarded the kirti chakra i think uh, yeah kirti chakra gallantry award yeah for the first time congratulations to and all these much deserved honors thanks a lot thank you very much super sir i'll just sign off by asking you about your thoughts on you know the state of the aircraft design and development industry in the country today uh, you know you all blazed a path in those days but i'm sure you'd be very pleased with how things have evolved since then yes i think the industry has evolved into a and developed into a very robust and good uh, industry which can be seen by the fact that lc has now flown almost i think 5000 odd developmental flights all without any major incident accidents which presents to a very robust design and testing process so i think we have reached a stage but i still feel that there should be more participation from the private sector so that you know new technologies new expertise new ideas more efficiency can be brought in and made this whole process faster because now how many aircraft are we manufacturing every year i don't think it is the desired rate right so things have to improve in the production line so that's i think we are well set to launch into the design and development of the next generation fighter so can i take a liberty and ask you about one small post air force incident in your career which is that you joined uh, captain gopinath in deccan as his chief pilot and you were at the controls during that uh, flight in hyderabad when the engine caught fire on startup so if you don't mind i'd love to hear uh, what happened what happened was we were uh, inaugurating the flight from hyderabad to vijayawada so and that was not the first flight that was way down after 2 3 months of operating the atr so we are we had parked we have ferried the aircraft in the morning from bangalore to hyderabad parked there in the tarmac there was a function going on captain gopinath and some ministers chandra babu naidu and all were there at that time right right i think the civil aviation minister rudy was also there yeah he was also there correct so venkaiya naidu was there so all these guys after the function they came to the aircraft Uh, Rudy Pratap Singh, Venkaiah Naidu, and some other press and other dignitaries, and then they were we were going to fly to Vijayawada, where they were waiting with a for us with another some sort of a reception. So the aircraft had been parked for two three hours, and when we started the engine, one of the engines uh, caught fire. Mm. So basically, we shut it down immediately and stopped and evacuated everybody. but what actually happened was that the engine was not on fire some fuel had accumulated in the drain cup mm-hmm. while the aircraft was parked some fuel was leaking it had accumulated and once the engine started that fuel caught fire in the exhaust okay so it it gave the impression and with all the press being there it made a very right. <laughs> big sensation <laughs> news in the yeah. paper in fact uh, we got the dgc involved straight away and the aircraft was cleared by the night and next day we flew the aircraft empty to vijayawada completed that you know uh, whatever we were supposed to do of course the function was not held because it had to be called off the previous day right 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 but that was the incident which happened <laughs> and you were in the left seat is it huh? yeah i was uh, there was a foreign captain I was still doing my training to be a captain. Okay. So I was sitting on the left, and he was as instructor sitting on the right. On the right. Okay. Yeah. No, I think also he had a lot of detractors who then used that occasion to cast doubt on his safety of his operation. And all yeah. It's yeah. quite unfortunate, I think. Right. Correct. Correct. Which was just one of those things. But just because press with no press around, all we were seeing is some fire that airman would have told us. to technician would have told us to stop the aircraft shut down yeah shut down shut down we would have shut down and then we would have filed a report with dgc and the investigation would have been done nobody would have come to know nothing would have been known but yeah. <laughs> it just so happened it was not kept up is there yeah recovered quite well from that i must say no it was a good uh, this thing i mean we pioneered the low cost model in india people started traveling only because of where they can truly truly very true great sir thank you so much for your service thank you so much for the time that you've taken to speak with me 
for the audience, you know, Minko Kotial has been struggling with some health issues, but despite all that, he's agreed to speak to us. So we're just deeply, deeply grateful to you, sir, for your time you spent with us. Thank you, Gana. Thank you very much for having me over. Well, folks, that's all we have time for this week. Join us again next week. In the meantime, sign up for updates at blueskiespodcast.com. There you'll find links to follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. You can also write to us with your comments, questions, suggestions, and feedback from the website or to blueskies at prganapati.com. Subscribe to the podcast on any podcasting platform such as Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and even on YouTube. If you like what you heard, share it with your friends, give us a rating in your favorite podcasting app, and write us a review. It will help other people find us. I want to give my thanks to Saurav Chaudhia for our logo and Prithvik for the music. I want to reiterate that all the views expressed here are personal and this podcast has not been approved by or reviewed by the Air Force, Ministry of Defense or any branch of the government. In the meantime, stay safe and Jai Hind.